Hi, Jimmy. Hello. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. I'm for you. <laughs> Uh, it's good. I think the Dharamsala weather is a little better. Uh, the monsoon has ended. Uh, yeah, so weather is great. Uh, so we're gonna start in shortly. Namatsama <laughs> Can I interrupt? My kiram to get on in the Susa, uh, Susa. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, uh, I'll, I'll start. We, we'll have our discussion in English. Uh, so, but then we are having our discussion right now in English so that we could reach a wider audience. And, but we all previously we had, uh, uh, sessions in Tibetan language. So let's uh, start uh, with our seventh uh, Tibet climate crisis talk and uh, welcome to me. Uh, so uh, climate change has been a major issue uh, uh, in the global scenario. And uh, recently uh, the COP26 is coming up and it has gained a tremendous attention and uh, governments are coming together to formulate policies and uh, submit their uh, plans and uh, to, to combat the climate change uh, crisis uh, uh, in, the, in the world. Uh, however, we have uh, discussions of, uh, from the civil society groups, uh, especially from the young uh, uh, students uh, saying that uh, the government's policies are not enough uh, and uh, thus we see uh, and we witnessed lots of climate crisis. Uh, and uh, so today's discussion, we will focus more on China's role in uh, global climate change negotiation and then how that uh, really impacts in Tibet as well. So today we have our um, speaker, uh, Chimi, Dr. Chimi Yudela. And uh, Chimi Yudela uh, is right now an uh, associate uh, fellow uh, of the climate change at the National Maritime Foundation, New Delhi. Uh, she holds a CDRI fellowship at the Coalition for Disaster Resilience Infrastructure, working on the project incorporating infrastructure resilience in India's support-led development model. Uh, she also uh, recently uh, has a, 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 a KK Naren Fellowship uh, at the National Mar uh, Maritime Foundation and uh, undertaking uh, basically more on climate change uh, research in coastal uh, India, Indian cities. And uh, Chimi also uh, uh, was a training at the European Parliament, uh, Brussels, uh, Belgium in 2017. And uh, she has also interned at the Center for Science and Environment, New Delhi. Uh, Chimi has recently also completed her PhD uh, with the title, uh, a PhD thesis titled uh, The European Union and China in the Climate Change Negotiation from Copenhagen to Paris. And uh, she has completed her PhD also from uh, AMPHIL from JNU at the same University School of International Studies. And uh, her MA is in uh, was in politics uh, from the School of uh, International Studies JNU and BA in political science uh, at uh, uh, University of Delhi. Uh, so before we start our discussion, I would uh, request our viewers to you know post your comments or questions in the comment session and. Uh, after uh, Chimi's presentation, then we have a Q and A session. Uh, thank you, and floor is yours, Chimi. Thank you. Uh, let me share my screen first. Uh, can you confirm? Is it visible, what's wrong? Yeah? Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, now, can I start? Sure, sure. 
Uh, and good evening, everyone. At the very outset, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Loksangla for inviting me to your uh, climate crisis talk series. I'm delighted to be part of it. The title of my uh, today's presentation is uh, China's Position and Strategic Objectives in International Climate Change Negotiations. I'm a political scientist, uh, so my presentation will largely be dealing with social, economic, and political aspect of the issue. I won't be uh, dealing with science part of it. So this is an uh, uh, overview of my uh, today's present presentation that I'll be speaking for 20 minutes or so. First, I'll uh, try to set a context by uh, discussing climate change and international climate change negotiations briefly. And then I'll uh, try to discuss China's participation in climate change negotiations and the drivers and factors that led to uh, that led China's participation. And also uh, I'll uh, discuss China's strategic priorities in climate change act, act, uh, sorry, action. And thereafter I di I'll discuss the implementation expectations and realities. And thereafter I, I will briefly discuss the implement uh, uh, implications um, if there's any climate actions in the Tibetan Plateau. So, as we know that, uh, and also, also Lopsan has already set a background for my uh, discussion, but I would like to discuss a bit of uh, the, uh, the current status of climate change and the causes of it. As we know that climate change crisis is one of the uh, most social economic political and environment challenges of the present world. The primary causes of global warming is predominantly the result of um, concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, which is caused by human activities such as burning of fossil fuels, deforestation, and industrialization that has been taking in last uh, 50 to 60 years, uh, which brought new risks and vulnerabilities. This is the current status of global warming, and this report has came out recently and the, the a sixth IPCC assessment report provides a new estimates about uh, the chances of crossing global warming a level of 1.5 degrees Celsius in the, in the next few decades. Where it underlines that one um, first threshold of 1.5 degrees Celsius will, lead to, uh, will lead to serious and irreversible consequences for the centuries and um, these two are uh, recent um, scenarios. And the present world is more integrated and interdependent than ever before. As a result, threats uh, from existential risks such as health pandemics and climate change has become more serious with the expected increase in the intensity and frequency of extreme uh, weather events and more unpredictability of anthropogenic uh, climate risks. Uh, demands are urging global climate action and attention. And uh, given the global nature of climate change problem, the puzzle to solve the problem has been carried out within the framework of United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. The UNFCC uh, Triple C was adopted and ratified in 1992 and entered into the force um, after two years in 1994. And uh, this intergovernmental uh, process and uh, convention facilitate and provides a uh, provincial where parties to the con uh, convention to discuss and negotiate a common collective action to be agreed or implemented. That includes uh, the measures, uh, mitigation measures for the reduction of temperature rise and carbon emission. And it also tries to identify the means, means to limit and check global communities vulnerabilities to the effects of climate change. Um, this is the China also. Through this presentation, I'll uh, try to focus only on China's, uh, um, who is the largest uh, uh, greenhouse gas emitter and largest developing countries, its role and position in three climate, uh, major climate uh, agreements, uh, such as Kyoto Protocol, Copenhagen Agreement, and Paris uh, Climate Agreement. And uh, the primary goal of China's policy has been to prevent the setting of emission targets from hampering its economic uh, growth and modernization. And um, the, the Chinese government has been arguing that the develop, 
uh, developed countries or NX1 are the principal emitters of the greenhouse gas, uh, gases and should bear the primary consequences or responsibility in addressing climate change problem. And if we look at the Kyoto Protocol, China's um, position on the climate change at the Kyoto Protocol Conference is known as the policy of three no's. Where it's, uh, there's no objection on China, no voluntary commitment by, by China, and no future negotiation to binding China. And in the, in the case of uh, Bali, the climate change policy has been to avoid making concrete commitments on the reduction of greenhouse gases emission based on its principle of common but differentiated responsibility of the Korea protocol. Uh, however, in the case of uh, Copenhagen, um, China formed the close links with uh, developing countries such as Brazil, India, Mexico, and South Africa, and they prepared a phase of with industrialized nations or global uh, north. China played a assertive role in Copenhagen as China is the only leading voice representing the G77 group. And it has uh, uh, presented uh, major three objectives to set a deeper con a quantified emission reduction targets for developed countries uh, for the second commitment period under the Corridor Protocol. And it has proposed that each uh, developed country should uh, contribute 1% of its gross domestic product to help developing countries to combat climate change. And it also insists that it should take responsibility for uh, carbon mitigation, but it cannot take responsibility beyond its capabilities. And it, uh, from this, China, it clearly shows that Chinese leaders are um, stubborn, uh, that the competing climate change must not deter the economic development. Here, if you look at the uh, China's role in, um, on the road to the Paris Agreement, um, in the Kenkin, in, in the following year uh, of uh, Copenhagen in the uh, conference uh, COP20, uh, COP16, it agreed. Uh, it was agreed in uh, Kenken, um, Mexico, in 2010 to continue to negotiate and the post uh, global climate treaty when the Kyoto Protocol first commitment period ended, where China continued to defend its rights and interests, and also um, it where it could uh, address issues which were core of its national interests. In the case of uh, Durban, China called for new uh, green climate fund, emphasizing the significance of common but differentiated responsibility, uh, which has been consistent. And also China entered the Durban negotiations in a positive and more cooperative spirit, where uh, the developed or NX1 countries agreed to um, provide the climate fund. And also on the... Um, uh, on the road to Warsaw, in the 19th conference of the parties at Warsaw, they set a deadline for Paris uh, climate deal, and um, they were to submit the proposal for climate actions plan with specific reference to mitigation and adaptation, uh, where they were to submit intended nationally determined contributions. And China also has submitted its in, in INDC, where it agreed to hold increase in a global average temperature well below, but um, it's mostly to peak in carbon dioxide emission by 2030 with the best efforts to be earlier. And China also pledged to uh, source 20% of its energy from low carbon sources by 2030 and cut emission per uh, unit of GDP by 60 to 65% of 2005 levels by 2030. And it's also uh, put its um, Pledge to peak uh, the carbon emission, putting it close to peak by 2027. 20, However, at the um, Paris Agreement, the three key objectives of Paris Agreement uh, were to hold increase in global uh, average temperature to well below two, two degrees Celsius pre industrial levels and pursue effort to limit the increase to 1.0 degrees Celsius. However, China um, also reached an agreement and it pledged to uh, be, reach uh, peak its carbon emission around 2030 and increase the non-fossil share of its primary energy to 20, uh, uh, 20%. However, in the, 
if if we look through China's participation in its journey uh, through the international climate change negotiations, um, in recent years, China's climate change policies have undergone major changes. Although China consistently holds to the stance that environmental protection should not be achieved at the expense of the economy and refuse to impose targets on the total um, emission of carbon dioxide. However, it has become more proactive in dealing uh, with the issue by making new uh, policy initiatives. If we look at the drivers and factors that led to shift China's position and approach at international climate change negotiations, uh, one of the major factors is energy security. This energy security is the China's top priority, um, policy priority, not primarily because it is requisite for uh, sustainable development, but it is uh, about the uh, political survival of PRC as well, simply because the legitimacy uh, of the PRC is determined mainly by its capacity to maintain growth and development. And also uh, the growing uh, consciousness and awareness of vulnerability of Chinese um, ecology and its environment, where um, the booming economy of China derived from its ambitious um, development uh, development model, which has resulted in resource depletion and environment degradation. And China now recognizes that the difficulty of climate change faces not only on the environment, but, but also the socio-economic and political development of the country at risk. And also China understands the abatement challenge that it would face in adopting an ambitious uh, carbon reduction target as it prioritizes the risks of its economic growth and employment and social stability over the sustainability of growth. And another uh, important um, reason why China's position moved from being defensive to cooperative and collaborative approaches is mainly because of uh, global climate regime instruments instrumentalized to attract China uh, by offering uh, various incentives in the form of funding or uh, transfer of technologies for actions to mitigate and adapt to climate change in exchange for supporting a blind and binding climate agreement. And these are the several factors that are responsible for pursuing China to adopt a more favorable climate change policy. And if you look at the strategic objectives, um, uh, China, um, China's uh, strategy objectives. Uh, first is climate change exacerbated political and social uh, stages within China, uh, which uh, leaders, uh, ex leaders especially concerned about the impact of climate, uh, climate and environment impact of political stability. And so a state is firmly determined to maintain the peace um, Pace of the growth, uh, pace of the economic growth, and again, um, such again, such background, China's climate change diplomacy took a shift towards a greater co a collaboration and reciprocity um, because its design of the international climate regions offers positive incentive, and also China also intends to occupy the commanding heights in a new round of competition that is centered on green technology and its economy and also developing a low carbon economy is the core of core element of the economic structure transformation and also it will strengthen the nation's technological competitiveness and eventually uh, china hopes to become the engine uh, of economic growth at the same time at the international level um, china is determined to protect itself as a uh, government ready to shoulder international responsibility in um, line with the status of significant rising power. However, uh, if we look at the expectations um, of such implementation versus the reality, and as we have seen that China has pledged to uh, have carbon dioxide peak, carbon dioxide emission peak before 2030, um, as per uh, 20, 
2005 level and achieve carbon neutrality before 2060 and also in its 45 year on, uh, for energy, uh, energy development china has uh, mentioned that use of renewable energy natural gas and nuclear power will continue to grow and the uh, use of high carbon fossil fuel will be greatly reduced and it also Says that uh, non-fossil fuel will account for about 20% of the total, uh, total energy consumption and natural gas will account for about 15% and new uh, energy, energy demand will mainly be satisfied by clean uh, energy sources. However, if we look at the realities, China is, uh, China's energy consumption is still rising and uh, and the emitting billions of um, tons of climate uh, carbon dioxide emission, they, um, the, but uh, coal, China's coal consumption has peaked. If you look at this uh, graph, the China's coal consumption has peaked um, in 2004 to 2000, uh, and it has peaked most in 2016. But if you look after uh, the uh, Paris Agreement, uh, China's uh, first significant rise in um, greenhouse gas emission uh, in 2007, after three consecutive year uh, consecutive of no growth in China, has shown, and China is still leading um, leading carbon emitter in absolute terms, which accounts for uh, around 66 percent of its coal consumption, and with this uh, trend, um, China. Uh, we're likely to fail uh, to peak carbon production. And also it's because the, um, ne nearly half of the Chinese population were city dwellers and another 280 million formerly rural people are were expected to move uh, to urban. And also China's electricity industries are still lobbying for more um, number of coal fire, uh, coal, coal fire power stations to be built in China and China's. If you look at the China's transition to a low carbon energy, um, to meet uh, this goal, China's uh, low carbon um, transition, China's transition to low carbon energy, uh, it is envisaged that energy sector needs to reform from both supply and consumption end, but whereas consumption and supply both are still uh, rising. And on the supply and um, the reform should be focused on promotion of clean and effective use of coal. And on the consumption end, the reform focus should largely be on limiting the development of high energy intensity industry. However, in the reality, it is something dif uh, different. Because uh, firstly, large cities are already, uh, those who have already managed to reverse emission growth have done so by cutting down on heavy industry and power generation within the city limits. However, this means they have uh, to import these, uh, import more industrial products or the electricity from elsewhere. And at some point, um, you run out of places to move the heavy industry and power to, and these could potentially move much of the industrial production abroad or somewhere else. And in this case, uh, such in this case, uh, the one of the best options for relocating the industry or emission reduction projects is uh, Tibet or Tibetan Tibet K2. For instance, um, I'm going to discuss three factors uh, to look into uh, this, how China is uh, offsetting their carbon emissions and also transferring their industry into Tibetan K2. First, uh, to look into the uh, green great wall project on uh, Tibetan K2 and hydropower plants, and also uh, I'll discuss a bit about uh, the electric vehicles. Uh, first, China has initiated a green, uh, green great wall project on Tibetan K2, attempting to offset its carbon footprint, also to combat the advancing desert along China's northern frontier. The project is intended to cover 42% of China's land. This uh, project is considered as the biggest afforestation project in the world 
and hence much appreciated internationally. Uh, however, with afforestation um, project uh, can be a um, way to reduce carbon dioxide emission. Planting trees on less favorable land may result in desertification because uh, China are, China is planting um, this massive afforestation project on the unfavorable land, doing more harm than just good. To the lack of proper environmental assessment, impact assessment, uh, overemphasis on planting non-native trees or unfavorable land may it's exacerbating and um, and it's just uh, yeah, exacerbating the existing problems and research also um, there's also increase in human activity on the Tibetan Plateau which has disturbed the growth and distribution of vegetation because the, uh, the Tibetan Plateau is determined uh, by the local climate condition which are affected by human activity uh, due to its sensitivity and also vulnerability and um, um, to the environmental change. And apart from this, most of the, uh, the clean development mechanism uh, projects are developed um, in Tibetan Plato, uh, mostly on, by, um, in the particularly in Tibetan Plato, uh, in terms of hydropower um, projects. Because um, the Tibetan Plato is known as water tower, being the source of major rivers in China, South Asia, and Southeast Asia, uh, China could construct some of these largest, largest hydropower plants on the river of Tibetan Plato with the help of the climate fund. Uh, but the ecological concern has not been raised uh, concerning the conduct of the project. And most of the CDM projects are associated with land rights issues and human rights abuses. And also hydropower plants uh, in China are constructed without consulting local communities. Uh, the settlement of local communities is one of the most common problems resulting from uh, uh, resettlement or resettlement of large communities. Uh, local communities is one of the most common problems resulting from large hydropower projects. It raises the moral issues of effects of climate change on displacement and loss of sense of place. And also the development of um, project without consolidating resource development communities further increases environmental problems and leads to greater vulnerability to the impact of climate change. And also, uh, China is also this massive um, mining uh, is also going on rare earth min mineral resources and um, are going on in Tibet uh, to feed and to develop uh, the electric vehicles, which uh, can be uh, built only by the lithium, which is uh, which can be found in Tibet. These are uh, some of the uh, projects that are taking place in China, uh, taking place in Tibet, and also the uh, their massive adverse impact of such projects. And it suggests that they. Uh, have not only a fundamental flow but also impacts the land cover changes, including permafrost, uh, grassland degradation, deforestation, and desertification. If um, if we also look at the uh, climate, sorry for the typo climate action and climate action and implementation in China and um, Tibet and Peru, uh, China is recently. Uh, when it comes to Tibet, one of the major climate-related uh, action initiated by uh, chi under China under Xi Jinping was red uh, ecological li lines. It is one of the major climate action plan in Tibet. Under this uh, project, numerous Tibet, uh, Tibetan traditional grassland and nomadic areas or uh, and sacred mountains riverine, are identified as protected land. And uh, meaning all the protected areas will be centralized by the Chinese government. By um, meaning uh, local nomads and resource development communities are completely losing their ownership and access to their ancestral, uh, ancestral and significant religious land. In reality, those grassland or uh, the river line or sacred mountains which comes into the red line eco red, uh, red ecological lines have been conserved and preserved by the traditional means by the Tibetans until and unless massive developmental uh, projects or mining um, projects carried out in such places, these 
cases need not, not to be put under such restrictive uh, policies. Uh, this is another uh, major uh, climate action project carried in China. They have 50 city projects on its drive from climate resilience, um, climate resilience and in five sectors, it's been carried in five sectors, land use and resilience, waste and energy, and uh, climate action and mobility. Sorry, yeah, uh, climate action and mobility. Uh, this is over, uh, this uh, project is for over 17 year period from 2000 to 2016. Uh, however, if you look at this land use, um, uh, land use and resilience project, uh, the ceiling of the um, Chennai capital and Tendu, Tendu in the ways of uh, climate resilience project, the only ceiling and Tendu are the two nearest um, Tibet area which are related to climate action policy. However, TAR, uh, the Lhasa city is completely excluded of, even though it is one of the most fragile ecosystem and vulnerability, uh, vulnerable to climate change impacts. As, is, as it is evident in the recent IPCC 6 reports that how Himalayan pressure is melting rapidly due to the global climate temperature rise. And in terms of climate action and mobility, there's no any uh, cities or uh, region that were included, uh, that are from Tibetan K2 are included. And also uh, recently, um, Xi Jinping has repeatedly mentioned that Tibet should prioritize ecological protection and promote high uh, quality development. If we look at this 14 five year plan, there's a green development and high quality development uh, usually, high quality development is related to BRI, but uh, when it comes to Tibet in the Tar region, he has mentioned that it should uh, be high. Uh, it should be. It should. They should promote the high quality development. But um, however, these green development projects are just jargons and rhetoric when it comes to Tibetan K2, as uh, because the, the, the many reasons that I have mentioned above. And also, this is this is uh, this slide talks about why Tibet the third pole should be included in the climate change negotiations, and because the Himalayan peaks are warming between zero to uh, it's already warming uh, close to one degree Celsius faster than a global average, which is devastating, is which has a devastating consequences for 1.6 billion people living in the mountains and the down on stream countries, and. Also, IC Mode has stated that even in the best narrow or uh, case narrow, Himalayan mountains will lose more than one third of their ice by the end of the century. And also, the climate models or scientific uh, reports show that the summer flow in the Indus, Ganges, and Brahmaputra and the snow feet uh, tributaries will actually rise to um, 2050 as the glacier melt, uh, melts away, but will start decreasing after that because there will be no more ice left. And um, also the glacier melting will increase sea level rise and um, the it will accelerate the impacts on the riparian countries in terms of mass migration, water crisis, food production, land use change, and loss of habitat for uh, human and climate change, uh, so change in the monsoon pattern uh, in the downstream countries as well. And this is the way forward um, to, uh, this is to ensure that some of the less developed CD um, or the threatened K2 have low, uh, e low emission features ahead of them. And also they should be emphasized, emphasized on sustainable growth principles um, as they are developed. More so the adaptation policy and resilience enhancement in this region should be the priority. And um, major cuts to the greenhouse gases have been welcomed and co benefits to China, but it should uh, stop and they should focus more on the on ground uh, resilience uh, building.
And also it is important to look at the maladaptation and potential negative consequences of current adaptation and development strategies that's been taken in um, China and in uh, Tibet particular. And there's also low empirical evidence on what uh, it's, um, the adverse um, impact of the climate, um, these development projects or the mild adaptation looks like. So there is more work required in this area. And also it needs a participatory and inclusive decision-making process and a platform for the pa uh, participatory risk management must be explored. Uh, so I, I'm done here. I think I'll stop here. If there's any questions, comments, I welcome. Thank you, Jimmy. Uh, thank you so much, Jimmy. I think uh, your presentation is really uh, wonderful and it has been really a deep analysis. And uh, I'm sure uh, you know, your presentation has uh, really helped our viewers to get understanding of the basics of the uh, UN uh, COP meeting or climate change meetings. Uh, so in the like you you talked about the background of uh, your COP meetings and how UNFCC, C, United Nations Climate Change uh, Convention works. And uh, so it started uh, in early 1990s. And so uh, that's uh, really, I think, uh, very helpful information to us. And then also in your presentation, you talked about, uh, I think, uh, the major discussions that we have, the Global South and Global North, uh, they arguments when it comes to you know taking the responsibilities we will have more discussion later and then um i think uh, one uh, uh, important uh, uh, you know the pol uh, issues that you raised in uh, in your presentation is uh, why china is taking uh, global climate change uh, negotiations or uh, policy makings because i think uh, one uh, you also talked about the the, the ccp's legitimacy uh, if they don't act, uh, uh, you know, positively, then that will also pose a threat to their legitimacy. And then the, when we look, look at the uh, climate change and uh, environment protection, then there is another question of economic development. And uh, so the China doesn't want to have, a, you know, a, a negative impact on the growth of uh, the economic. So that is also, um, I think, uh, very interesting issues that uh, you, you raised. And then you also talked about the, um, the expectations and the realities of China's uh, policies and uh, its implementation at the ground. Uh, uh, ground level and uh, so talking about the coal and then solar energy or the renewable energy so that was uh, I think very uh, helpful and very informative and when then you focused on Tibet and specifically the Chinese government's policy of afforestation and uh, hydropower projects I think we would like to have a more discussion uh, later and then you also talk uh, mentioned about uh, why Tibet should be included in the global climate uh, discussions and also you know the uh, why what are the Chinese governments uh, you know the policies in that so with that I have uh, as I uh, mentioned earlier uh, to me my question is also that uh, in the in in your initial um, presentation you talked about uh, what the Chinese government says is that the policy or the, the idea of common but differentiated responsibilities where they say that the developed countries have already developed and, uh, and during their industrial uh, uh, times, they have already caused uh, pollution. So now it's the time of the developing countries to you know, focus more on economic development and uh, so take less responsibility on uh, uh, environment protection. So can you uh, uh, share more on the debate of Global South and Global North in terms of taking the climate change responsibilities? Uh, sure, thank you. Thank you for your uh, question. Uh, regarding the debate uh, uh, about Global South and Global North, uh, the climate change negotiation has uh, is largely uh, divided based on uh, the discussion between Global South and Global North. Uh, the, uh, the, it, 
the whole discussion is basically about the debate between the developed, which is Annex 1 and uh, developing countries with Annex 2, to identify and uh, limit and minimize ever increasing um, threat of global climate change. And this uh, climate change negotiation has been divided on the issues of common uh, but differentiated responsibility, uh, where it talks about the historical, um, uh, historical carbon emission and also how uh, the developing countries still uh, have the right to develop as uh, developed countries already have. And it also has the discussion is also based on equity and representation, unequal participation. It involves in all these. So when um, we talk about China, uh, developed countries are already, um, countries are historically accountable for greenhouse gas emission, but now uh, looking at the current rate of global warming, it is difficult to confront, confront the challenge, especially um, when the impact of climate change hit fast and hardest on the marginalized country or the developing countries, those who do not have adaptive capacity and less uh, um, are poor than those with the power who has the capability to adapt to the impacts. So since the dimension of vulnerability impact is different, all uh, the countries have different steps on the negotiating table. And also now uh, uh, looking at the very recent report, we do not have much window left to meet the target and to meet um, to reduce uh, the uh, carbon emission. So I think instead of uh, Yes, there is a, 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 a responsibility are differentiated, but now we do not have much window left. So I think uh, in case of China, it's the largest carbon emitter and it also is uh, growing at a very rapid pace. So uh, China has a huge responsibility in that case. Also, China's uh, carbon emission will determine what um, climate change or future world looks like. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your uh, answer. Yeah. So, yeah, I think it's also interesting because I think we say that, you know, the climate change uh, crisis, the climate crisis has uh, does not have a, you know, uh, in the border, right? And uh, so India and China, uh, you know, being the developing country, but then they are the major greenhouse gas emitters. And uh, so unless and until, you know, my understanding is that unless and until India and China, you know, does not take uh, effective uh, solutions or, uh, uh, you know, the policies or um, mitigating the climate change, then the, uh, the the efforts put by the rest of the country will not be effective unless and until the big countries take responsibilities. So I think uh, that's also a very interesting uh, topic. And uh, another issue that I would like to raise here is about the, you mentioned about, um, and the Chinese government's uh, policies, and uh, it's it's interesting because I think when when, when we look at uh, uh, your presentation, the Chinese government has uh, lots of pledges saying that by uh, 2030, you know, the uh, the China will uh, you know reach to carbon neutrality. Uh, so they have uh, they use huge jargons, and then they talk about the green development. Then they talk about ecological, uh, you know, the, uh, civilization. Uh, but then I think uh, how, you know, when you talked about the in reality, so the, the policies that we see on the paper or, or on the news, even the Greta Thunberg, uh, her recent speech was like the, uh, you know, uh, carbon neutrality, blah, 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 and, uh, you know, net zero, blah, blah, blah. So that means that, you know, it's just the, you know, the it's just the policy and it doesn't have the, uh, you know, the uh, ground uh, implementation. So with China, I mean, when it comes to uh, UNFCC in the COP meetings, they pledge, right? But then it doesn't have a, uh, you know, what if the, uh, the countries when they pledge and then what if they don't implement their policies and whether the UNFCC has any legal mechanisms to, you know, put sanctions, those countries who doesn't you know, follow their promises. So what is your view on that? Mm, yeah, in case of uh, um, these um, legal mechanisms uh, in climate change negotiations, yeah, yes, I agree. 
uh, the climate change regime uh, does not have uh, legal uh, implications or if it is not legal legally binding uh, to the parties to the convention uh, more so uh, it is anarchy because climate change regimes anarchy does not have uh, it does not hold accountable and also it does not have a power to uh, implement or like it does not have power in uh, and also if you look at the china's how china has uh, ch um, shift its policy uh, towards more uh, proactive and collaborative it's also because the climate change negotiation their aims and objective has been down downsized because the ambition has reduced in the recent uh, Paris Agreement also it where it has given uh, opportunities for the uh, de developing countries or any uh, not only developing U.S. or uh, China who are fighting uh, not were who were reluctant to um, a pledge or uh, commit uh, have a robust climate uh, change policy. So in that case also uh, you see uh, climate change regime also is uh, not very. Really yeah, legally, it's not legally binding and um, China is also cooperative because it gives them the window to or like uh, um, opportunity to have an economic development. So the their um, uh, pledge has uh, now uh, they just submit their intended nationally uh, nationally determined contribution, which is just voluntary. So they can submit any uh, voluntary uh, pledge or any uh, con voluntary contributions. On the paper but on the reality also even if they don't uh, follow their um, uh, the pledges or if they fail to pledges there's no regime or no authority no legal mechanism which can be yeah um which can come down to and ask them so it does not hold accountable yes yeah i think that's very true because i think uh, maybe uh, you know we uh, should not uh, solely depend on the the pledges or ndcs uh, national determined uh, contributions that the governments uh, so ndcs is the the pledges that the governments mm, submits uh, uh, they they submit to the uh, cop meeting every 5 year so that's uh, that does you know cop 26 is really important and uh, so another issue that uh, Chimi, uh, I would like to raise is that uh, uh, even though I mean uh, during the Trump administration, you know, uh, in a, in a global scenario, China kind of uh, you know seen as the global climate change uh, leader. You know, they have taken the leadership. But then uh, when we look at the climate change, uh, climate change is also related to the human rights. Right. And uh, in, in terms of the Chinese government's human rights record, uh, you know, the recent events that's happening in, you know, Mongolia um, and also in Xinjiang and Hong Kong and uh, Tibet, uh, Taiwan, uh, when we see. So uh, China has to face international community and uh, people were raising voices uh, against the Chinese government's human rights violation. And also with the with the Tibet, I think. Uh, uh, you know, uh, when it comes to human rights, the, the climate change and the human rights, it's, it's also about the right of the people for food, water and shelter. And as you mentioned in the hydropower or also in the nomad relocation, people are not consulted and their rights were, you know, the taken away uh, with the government's policy. So, uh, so how is China, you know, dealing with uh, the human rights abuses to the various uh, people? And then at the same time, you know, in an international platform, uh, you know, they are seen as the climate change leader. So how does that function? And uh, what, what is the international community uh, saying on that? I think um, in terms of uh, China's accountability on the ground, um, I think um, there is lack of research uh, coming out from the ground and also international climate change negotiation largely looks into the carbon emission mitigation and adaptation policy, but it uh, lacks to have a ground reality um, environmental impact assessment report. They don't study that. So I think it is important to also have a um, monetary where they uh, not just to look at the carbon emission uh, 
mitigation of uh, carbon emissions, they also need to look into the ground reality that's happening and adverse impacts that's causing uh, the pro such projects causing on the environment, uh, local environment. And also, yeah, you rightly put out that um, Tibetan, there is uh, human rights abuses that's are facing, yes. Also, this climate change project, it lacks um, local communities resilience building mechanisms, in, uh, especially in terms of China, especially in terms of Tibet. And also, um, it needs to, that's uh, why I also pointed out, it needs to have an enhancing adaptive capacity and uh, building a capability in terms of uh, Tibetan community, because uh, Tibet Plato is very fragile and also people are also uh, not very not doing very economically well off and they do not have a cap adaptive capacity and instead these local people are displaced and deprived or deprived of uh, their land ownership and also uh, such um, incidents or uh, these events will um, have a, this will exacerbate the vulnerability of this community uh, to the impact of climate change so I think this is very important. Uh, China should uh, not just look into the economic development. They really need to yeah, uh, work into the local community or resilience building uh, of the local community uh, or the Tibetan, uh, Tibetan especially uh, Tibetans. Thank you, Shani. Uh, I would request if the viewers have any questions, uh, please uh, uh, share it on your comment session and then we will take your questions. And uh, another issue that, Chimi, in your presentation, you also talked about, uh, you, you, you focused on um, why Tibet Plateau should be, you know, that they uh, included in the global climate discussion. And then you mentioned about the, uh, uh, the, um, I see Mods report and also the other scientists saying that uh, the Himalayan glaciers are melting. And uh, so, as you know that, right? I mean, um, so when when the glaciers met, it will definitely have an impact on the sources of the rivers and then flowing on the downstream nations. Uh, but when we look at the, uh, the the downstream nations initiative, or uh, what are they doing uh, to the uh, you know the the glacier melting that is happening in um, in, in Tibet. Uh, I, I haven't seen any, uh, you know, the collaborative uh, work, uh, suppose like India or Bangladesh, when it comes to Brahmaputra or even in the Mekong uh, region, you know, so uh, the Chinese, more over the Chinese are building huge dams uh, on the uh, rivers that, that, that are flowing in Tibet. Uh, so, why are the downstream nations silent and why are they not challenging or why are they not saying anything uh, to China in terms of uh, you know infrastructure development or in terms of dam construction on the Tibet's uh, river? Yes, Lapsanla. Uh, I see Moot, yes, is working uh, towards building uh, resilience and raising awareness on mountain specific issues and challenges, uh, especially climate change induced impact on the Hin Hindu Kush Himalayan region. And um, there, um, but in the case of Hindu Kush Himalayan region, um, there is uh, some collaboration that's going on, I've seen but uh, they haven't included all the important uh, stakeholders in the um, discussion. I think that's something that we uh, should do. And also uh, the, all these downstream nations and uh, the Himalayan region, they, we should co cooperate on areas of um, mutual interest and ex uh, to exchange information and expertise between uh, the countries that can be one of the um, a possible solution, I think, and also more collaboration uh, with other institutions who work on similar uh, courses should also uh, bring out in terms of research campaign and advocacy, which is like um, something that is lacking in the um, country because, and also because when it comes with China or uh, China strongly holds the sovereignty issue. So they don't give much space to uh, space for discussion um, and collaboration that is the major yeah um 
that is something that is lacking. And I think Tom's team countries should work together. Also, in case of India and Bangladesh, they are trying to have a collaboration in case of sea level uh, sea level rise um, and also in the maritime issue. But they should also do more in the uh, land boundary issue area as well. Yeah. That's so, Jimmy. So now this is uh, uh, our last uh, uh, question, and uh, so it seems that we don't have uh, any questions from the viewers. Uh, so the my last co last question, uh, Jimmy, is that uh, in the coming uh, COP uh, twenty six, the Tibet groups are going to attend the COP, and they would raise the issue of uh, importance of the Tibetan plateau and why Tibetans should be included in the. Uh, you know, the global climate discussions. And so Tibet groups has been attending various, uh, you know, the COP meetings since, you know, Copenhagen. Uh, and uh, so, I mean, what, what's what's your idea? What's your suggestion? How how can, you know, Tibetans, uh, Tibet groups can, you know, put the significance of this uh, COP meeting and how can they do more effectively or, uh, you know, make more, uh, you know, bring more positive changes uh, inside here. So what, what's your view? Can you please share uh, in a briefly? Yes, I, I think when uh, we uh, discuss of, uh, of Tibet play, uh, the Tibetan play too, and um, which is uh, third pole, which, which is also known as third pole, we should uh, try to address it uh, along with the Arctic and Antarctica and Greenland, uh, Greenland because we should try to bring along with this uh, um, also poll, two other polls that will also be good because instead of uh, talking from um, the Tibetan plateau or uh, just not just melting or China's uh, development uh, projects in uh, uh, Tibet but we should also hold a uh, global uh, whole world is accountable for the um, global climate change and also which is also having huge impact on the Tibetan play too and so at the COP26 I think we should try to uh, with other um, such uh, institution who work on similar courses we should have more collaboration and try to bring Tibetan play to along with the two other poles uh, Arctic and Antarctica and second I secondly I think we should invest more on research uh, because there is lack of uh, regional studies conducted on the Tibetan plateau and that is something also we should do and not just in the scientific research but also on the uh, interdisciplinary study on the climate change impact on socio-economic and environment in Tibet and its impact on downstream uh, countries should also be uh, one way that you can raise at the uh, COP26 where you can ask for the climate fund because there's a huge climate fund where um, maybe could be a good idea also to um, put up this at the COP26, um, which can also uh, put a possible solution to increase science to policy and also to practice. Um, th that is my answer. I hope I have answered your question. Yes, yes, Jimmy. I mean, you, you raised, uh, you, you said that. Uh, uh increase uh you know more research and then apply for the climate fund and then also you know i mean uh, relating with the tibet issue third pole issue with the other you know the global climate issues like uh, uh arctic and antarctic and also the amazon i think uh, that's a, a really wonderful idea and uh so i would really like to thank Chimi sincerely for your effort uh, spending time and sharing your research and uh, giving us a wonderful, uh, you know, ideas. And I, I'm really sure that, you know, the our viewers have really helped from your presentation. And uh, lastly, I think um, uh, we have, uh, you know, every time, whenever possible, we organize Tibet Climate Crisis Talk. And if people are, uh, you know, willing to know more, please uh, visit our office website, uh, uh, www Tibet Climate Crisis. And then we have a Facebook page that you are uh, watching right now, Tibet Third Pole. And then we have an Instagram uh, as well, Tibet Climate Crisis. And I would request people to know, try to know more and share, like, and then spread the word with uh, words with your friends. Thank you so much, Jimmy. Thank you so much, Dr. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.